10 minutes remaining in today's uh, trading session. Joining us right now to help break down uh, today's trading activity, we've got Julie Hyman and Adam Johnson in the newsroom. Trader Noah Warsaw of Group One Trading standing by the Chicago Board Mercantile Exchange. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, also with us is Charlie Bobrinskoy, the Director of Research at Aerial Investments. It is a Monday. All right, Charlie, we're going to kick things off with you. A little crazy, but hey, listen, Don Hayes saying that sounds like there's still a lot of powder out there when it comes to the equity market. Do you agree? Yeah, we try not to make predictions about the market based on cash balances. We think that can be kind of dangerous. We prefer to look more at valuation and sentiment. But we are also bullish for maybe different reasons. We think people are still too anchored in where things were a year ago. When in fact, if you take a longer term perspective, stocks are still pretty cheap. Well, what does it get for the people to lift those anchors? I mean, uh, do we not at Dow, Dow 11,000 see people sort of pulling them out and shifting stuff back into uh, equity assets? Yeah, I think you're right, man. I think people are getting more comfortable with equities again. I think people got scared away from equities. People decided they weren't going to buy stocks again. They were going to keep all their money in cash. And that did make the market uh, excessively negative and cheap. Now people are getting more comfortable again that the world's not going to end, so they're looking at underlying values, and they're seeing that stocks uh, do represent very good values at this point. Hey, Charlie, what are you expecting for earnings this time around? I mean, the numbers, the outlook, certainly not as good as the previous quarter, but still looking pretty good. I mean, are you expecting it to, when all is said and done, to be a fairly upbeat quarter and that we'll actually see revenue growth and not just a lot of cost cutting again? Two things. Uh, one, we're going to have increases, so they won't be as dramatic as last quarter. You're right. But the actual earnings levels will be higher. And two, I guess I'm not so negative about cost cutting leading to profits. I think productivity increases are a big positive, and they're probably going to be permanent. So sure, I'd love to have revenue growth, but there's nothing wrong with getting earnings from cost containment. I mean, but we're used to getting earnings from cost containment, right? I mean, you don't want people to be stuck where they were a year ago. Uh, one great change would be to boost the top line rather than just firing people to boost the bottom line, right? Yeah, but one of the reasons why technology has been such a powerful effect, one of the reasons why America is one of the richest countries in the world is because we're more productive. And for a while, we got less productive. And so now if we're finding ways to put technology to work, to build better factories, to have smarter people, that's going to make us more productive. And in the end, that's what makes Americans wealthier, and that's what makes this country able to pay for the entitlement spending that we've always had. Hey, no, I want to bring you into this conversation. So talk to me a little bit about the mood. You know, we're going to get Alcoa earnings after the closing bell. You get GE on Friday. Uh, you also get uh, J.P. Morgan this week. It's a big week for earnings. What's kind of the mood there on the floor? Uh, the mood is a little bit muted, I guess you could say, due to the fact that the last earnings cycle was kind of a bust in terms of a volatility perspective. If you look at Alcoa, you can see the April 14 puts are trading about 17 cents with stock at 14.60. So implied volatility levels are very low. The market hasn't sold off 1% in 40 consecutive trading sessions. So because of that, low volatility levels and uh, kind of rather dampened expectations for earnings to play a huge catalytic role in driving the market. Yeah. Uh, let me bring back in uh, Charles here and ask him, what, what do you think about these companies that were, the, that were once talked about as zombies? I mean, you can lump AIG in there with a lot of the big banks, although from the March 9th lows, AIG is up like 500 percent, and the banks have only doubled or tripled. Uh, have these companies that, that, that fell so far and now have risen uh, so much uh, since the lows done their run? Are they finished with it, or can you still get any more gains out of these companies? I think there is something to be said for buying as the government starts to exit. I think you've had real overhangs on Citigroup in particular okay. uh, and AIG where the stocks have been kept lower because of this overhang. So if that overhang goes away, I think the stocks absolutely could trade higher. What do you think, Noah, as far as the financials? I mean, are people trading the financials uh, a, a lot more than they're trading everything else? Do you see a lot more action in those names? Well, I wouldn't say a lot more action because there's always been a lot more action in the financials than your average stock. But one interesting thing we've seen is the term structure in XLF, which is the spider financials. It's actually much more profound with Jan of 2012 trading at almost 40 percent higher in an implied volatility terms compared to the front month, which is April, that if you were to contrast that with, say, the Russell 2000, you're only seeing a 20 percent percent contango, so to speak, in the volatility term structures. So I think due to the impending regulation that financial companies are going to be facing, as well as a lot of uncertainty still surrounding their balance sheets, there's a lot of expected volatility the market's pricing in in the mid-months, but also in the back months. 
Uh, let's bring back in right now Noah and Charles. And I want to talk a little bit, uh, Charlie, with you about technology. You know, uh, you mentioned it earlier. People have been so bullish on technology, it seems, that come on this show. And yet the sector has uh, slightly underperformed the market this year. What is it going to take for tech to really get going since it seems like everybody loves it? Corporate spending, uh, in, in a nutshell. I think we've been disappointed that there hasn't been as much corporate tech spending as we and some other people had been predicting. Some of these names, like an Accenture and IBM, can be pretty late cycle. But we believe that there's going to be an awful lot of spending to complete the acquisitions that have been made, to, to put systems together, to blend systems. So we think there is going to be a refresh in 2010. But I have to admit, I've been a little disappointed so far. Hey, now, in terms of the technology trade, what are you seeing? Any kind of interesting trends there? Um, I don't trade any individual technology names, but we do trade the leveraged NASDAQ products and the mm -hmm. ETF super pit at SIBO, both QID and QLD. And we've seen a consistent volatility crush happening, as you would expect, with the VIX down near a three-year low. Listen, I want to go back to something that Dom talked about, because he mentioned double dip. You know, Charlie, we're hearing more and more folks talk about the potential for a double dip. Dip. You know, it was ruled out a couple months ago. Nobody was talking about it. We're hearing it again. We talked with Martin Feldstein earlier today. He hasn't ruled it out completely either. I mean, do you think we're completely out of the woods when it comes to the economy? You're talking to all these bears, Carol. I got to get them <laughs> off your program. No, these are people that are trying to justify the fact they've missed this hundred percent rally. And it's no, there's absolutely nobody in that you talk to in corporate America that is saying things aren't getting better. Sales are getting better. Some of it is from inventory restocking, obviously, but I don't have a single company in our portfolio who isn't saying things are getting better. I don't have a, a single indication of a double dip. Well, it's funny you say about inventory restocking. We have a story on the system today talking about uh, talking about Tiffany specifically, and I think also Home Depot. You've owned Tiffany for a while and talks about them restocking their inventories, adding new stores. I mean, that is a good sign, obviously, and I'm assuming you still own this one. We do at, at Ariel. It's still in our Ariel fund, and it's done very well. Now, I have to say, when you and I were talking about it, it was around 20. Mm -hmm. and now it's at 50. <laughs> so it's had a huge move here. It's been one of these names where people were worried about the end of the consumer, about consumers will never spend again, and that's been proven wrong. And so great companies like Tiffany, the stocks have done very well. At this point, Tiffany's growth is coming more from overseas, particularly Asia. But even their New York flagship is doing better. Investment bankers in New York are spending again. And Tif Tiffany's inventory, of course, never goes down in value. The values of those diamonds and gold rings just goes up in value. Do you tend to like a better uh, a company better, though, Charlie, when it's uh, going down, when it's cutting costs, uh, when you think that you're at the bottom of the stock? I mean, obviously, if they're raising revenue, if they're already hiring people, that's got to be priced in at least partially to the stock. Yeah, we're, we're value investors, so we tend to like things that are out of favor. We like it when everybody's negative on a name, and clearly they were on Tiffany a year ago and not so much today. So I really can't pound the table and say your viewers should go out and buy Tiffany stock today. I think you probably have missed it. It would probably be a hold for us at this point. Let's talk. Hey, Noah, I want to get uh, Charlie's thoughts on this as well because he was mentioning uh, that he wants companies to start spending again for technology. But let's talk about companies spending uh, on M&A. It seems like uh, there's been a, well, there definitely has been a pickup in M&A action, but you see also that um, companies are getting just as involved now as private equity, or at least the battle is there, which didn't, which it didn't used to be because private equity could leverage the heck out of all of their uh, purchases. What do you, what do you hear on the floor? What are you talking on the floor about this M&A action that we've seen, this wave? Uh, well, certainly our risk desk is all over uh, anybody coming for upside calls and looking to sell back months options because those are c clearly the plays people do when there's an impending merger to take place and as you mentioned yes the private equity space is no longer nearly as positioned to dominate as opposed to corporate companies given the dry up in liquidity but uh, sure M&A remains a very uh, very real fear uh, amongst option traders and in the individual equity names that I trade I certainly am um, very very defensive when I come for when I see paper coming and trying to put on trades that look like a possible merger. Hey, you know, Charlie, with all the deal flow today, we did have a bunch, a lot in the energy sector, also some talk about some other deals with uh, California Pizza Kitchen and Palm. I mean, are you looking at all in terms of, you know, your investment strategy at potential takeouts here or potential combinations? Yeah, we're still at very low levels in M&A versus where we were a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Matt's worried about revenue growth, and this is a way that a company can get revenue growth. 
uh, without you know, having to put out a whole new sales team throughout the world. So where you've got companies with a lot of cash on their balance sheet who maybe have a little bit of challenge growing revenue, M&A can make a lot of sense. If you can issue 4% bonds and buy a company for only 15 or 18 times earnings, it can be immediately accretive. I've actually been surprised there hasn't been more M&A activity. Hey, you know what? We're so, we're so close. At least I can feel that we're so close <laughs> to these Alcoa numbers. I got to ask you, Noah, uh, down the floor, what has the talk been like today about Alcoa? Because a lot of the stories I've seen, both on Bloomberg and on other uh, newswires, have been saying, hey, listen, in the past, Alcoa has been really a harbinger of bad times for the market. Well, Alcoa got crushed on their last earnings report. Uh, I follow this name a little closer than most because I do own it in my personal account, as do a lot of others in the pit. So I don't know if you want to take the ETF super pit as the best proxy for what the talk on the floor is. Um, the reality is, is that those 14 puts I mentioned earlier are pretty cheap. So I think the market's not really pricing in a possibility of a huge correction like we saw last time. And um, I would think uh, with the impl lower implied volatility levels, you can expect a more re muted response from the equity price of Alcoa when the numbers are released. All right, uh, Noah, thanks very much, and best of luck there with uh, your Alcoa shares. Charlie Wabrinskoy, thank you so much. Always a pleasure joining us from Ariel Investments.